to all those who devoted their lives to aviation. The Wings of Russia Studio presents Wings of Russia Documentary March 1956 Great Britain is getting ready for the visit of Nikita Khrushchev, leader of the country which was by that time practically closed for the West. Right on the eve of this event, TU-104, the Russian jet airliner, landed in London. Three days later, two more beauties of the same kind flew in. It was a sensation. The British Comet did not fly, the American jet first links were still under construction, and there you are, three Russian aircraft at a time. The Queen confessed that every time upon hearing the unusual turbines rumble, she got out to the balcony to see the Russian wonder. It all started half a century before the events described above. Civil Aircraft the air carriers. Aviation was a new passion of mankind. A boom of all kinds of constructions, first jumps, approaches and injuries. A total delight. Demo flights at the dawn of the century, just like today, attracted crowds of people. The brave ones willing to take a ride could not yet be called passengers. The developing civil aviation carried only mail and cargoes. Regular passenger transportations started later, after the First World War. The enormous amount of military aircraft equipment found its new commercial application. The number of air companies and airlines were growing like a snowball. Soon there were so much of them that the need to introduce flight rules became obvious. In 1919, representatives of six European air companies gathered in The Hague to form the Air Flight Rules Developing International Organization, the prototype of the one existing today. But all this was happening abroad. Russia, struggling its way through a revolution, was far from getting into mass passenger transportation. The main political events took place in Petrograd and Moscow. Thus, the Civil Economic Aviation Application Department, established at the Air Fleet Division in 1918, started preparation for the opening of an air route between the two capitals. Bolsheviks conducted negotiations on the purchase of military aircraft through Sweden. Therefore, the said department planned to open the second already international mail passenger air route between Petrograd and Stockholm. Both air routes, of course, were not commercial and were meant for fast delivery of all kinds of authorized officials and documents. While the Soviet power was gradually covering new regions of the country, the flight geography was expanding. Flights had to be performed on the outdated aircraft of the First World War, therefore defaults, engine fires, emergency landings on worn-out aircraft were not uncommon. Such flights were irregular and non-organized for the time being. Nevertheless, in January 1921, the country's leadership adopted a decree on air transportation. It established the first rules of the Soviet and foreign aircraft for flying over the territory of the Republic and its territorial waters. Provisions of this decree made the basis of the air code of the USSR. Foreign aircraft were mentioned in the document on purpose. Government's meetings continuously considered opening air flights between the Soviet Russia and Germany. Bolsheviks hoped that a proletarian revolution would occur there too.
A joint Russian-Germany air transportation company, Der Luft, was established in November 1921. While in spring of the next year, the first regular air route moscow königsberg was put in effect. Flights were performed twice a week by Soviet and German pilots on Fokker 3 aircraft. From the point of view of stability, safety and service, it was one of the best airlines in Europe. On February 23, 1923, the government established the Civil Aviation Council for further development of air transportation. That date became the official birthday of the National Civil Aviation. Already in March, pure Soviet air transportation entities were created to the form and content of the commercially successful Der Luft. They were based on the original principle. There was Dabrolot in the Russian Federation, Ukravozduhput in Ukraine, and Zak Avia in the Caucasus. Although the two latter did not stay long due to financial insolvency and later merged into the Dabrolot, which became a nationwide company. In the 20s, the state funds were being spent on the development of the Air Force as means of revolution protection. Money for the passenger aircraft were supposed to be donated by people. Association of the Air Fleet supporters was created with this purpose, which membership amounted to one million people just a year after its creation. Many young men became aviation fans in those years. The first 408 miles long internal regular air route was opened on July 15, 1923 between Moscow and Nizhny Novgorod. The first flight was performed by Yakov Moiseev, who served as pilot in the Civil War and was one of the first to be awarded the Order of the Red Banner. The development plan for the nearest years envisaged introduction of new air routes in Siberia, the Far East, the Caucasus and Middle Asia. Throughout the 20s, nearly all aircraft were foreign. They were mainly produced by the Dornier company. The most renowned civil foreigner was the all-metal Junkers F-13, capable of carrying four passengers. Made in 1919, this aircraft was cost-efficient and had good flight characteristics. All primary air routes were serviced by those aircraft. Besides, Junkers was used in air schools and agriculture. It was a real working machine. At the same time, civil aircraft of national design started to appear. The first among them, AK-1, was built in Tsagi. Capabilities of making a national passenger aircraft were discovered in the course of its creation. In the beginning of 1924, pilot Apolinari Tamashevsky took this aircraft into the air. Tests were successful and in June AK-1 was transferred to Dabrolot under the Latvian Guard name. Andrei Tupolev conducted research in a different direction. While AK-1 was a wooden construction, Tupolev made its experimental passenger ANT-2 an all-metal aircraft. It took off in May 1924. This minor three-seat aircraft gave birth to one of the world-renowned design bureaus. In 1925, a passenger aircraft was created by another designer, which name later became widely popular. Nikolai Polikarpov made its PM-1 specifically for the Moscow-Beijing air flight. The airframe was traditional for those years. The open pilot's seat was followed by a cabin for five passengers. The aircraft was built in just three months, however, the flight was shifted to an earlier date and the aircraft missed the event. After a minor workout, the aircraft was put on the Moscow-Berlin route.
The main thing that differed military aviation from the civil one was that the main requirements for the latter were cost efficiency and profitability. Better characteristics could be achieved by increasing the speed, passenger load, and the aircraft range. In the West, every new commercial aircraft had to undergo a specific contest. An aircraft was perspective only if it was more profitable than the other. The Soviet Union was a unique country. On the one hand, the economy was accounted for, but if political expediency was at stake, profitability could be victimized. From 1923 to 1928, the total civil aviation mileage amounted to 8 million kilometers. 28,000 passengers and 700 tons of cargo were transported. The figures were so far not much impressive, just 15 passengers per day. But the number of routes and their range continued to grow. And all this demanded renovation of the aircraft fleet. Konstantin Kalinin actively developed passenger aircraft in Kyiv. He built his first K-1 four-seat machine at his own initiative in 1925. In September, the aircraft was taken to Moscow for final tests. It was approved for service in civil aviation and further development. As a result, the designer got his own manufacturing bases in Kharkov. The first machine was followed by all metal K2 and K3, which were also used in an ambulance version. Then came K4. This aircraft, produced in small number, could carry four passengers and luggage. In 1928, the ambulance version of this aircraft was demonstrated at the aviation exhibition in Berlin. But the real success came to Kalinin with the appearance of K-5 aircraft. The most accessible national materials were used in its airframe. The test copy made its takeoff in 1929 and a year later K-5 was put into serial production. The aircraft carried eight passengers at a distance of 800 kilometers. 260 aircraft were built within four years. They were the ones that substituted German aircraft. Cheap and cost-efficient, K-5 became the most popular aircraft in the civil aviation of the 30s. In the first decade after the revolution, Bolsheviks were compelled to use the old-time specialists opposing the new power. However, by the 30s, universities of the USSR started to produce their own managing staff. They were characteristic for a lot of energy and virtually no experience. Reforms were started in the civil aviation full of confusion and chaos. In February 1930, the Civil Aviation Council was abolished and its functions were transferred to the Chief Inspection. New efficient forms of work were sought for. In autumn, with the purpose of further centralization of civil aviation of the USSR, the chief inspection and the Dobrolyot company were terminated. Instead, the old Union civil aviation amalgamation was established. In February 1932, the amalgamation was transformed into the chief directorate of civil aviation, which acquired the name of Air Flot. Strange enough, but all this reorganizational chaos was accompanied by the quantitative and qualitative growth of the aircraft fleet. The country announced the course toward industrialization and that brought demand for a fast delivery of all kinds of superiors between numerous construction sites of socialism. Besides, aviation was used to deliver precious metals and stones as well as furs from Siberia for export. Aircraft brought metrics of central newspapers into regions, so tasks for the aviation were numerous but minor. That's why in the 30s mostly small aircraft obtained wide distribution. Different versions of U-2 were used for transportation. No less popular was Sha-2 amphibious aircraft of Vadim Shavrov. 
It was widely used in Siberia where there were practically no roads and a lot of lakes and rivers. Alexander Yakovlev Design Bureau built a number of the so-called aircraft limos. The five-seat AIR-5 was the first among them. But there were no engines in the country of adequate power. So the three-seat AIR-6 with a less powerful engine went into production. The Polykarpov's U-2 biplane proved to be the best aircraft for agricultural works. These minor airplanes were used for spraying cereals and cotton crops, fighting grasshoppers and other blasts. Minor aircraft production for the needs of civil aviation was based on the fact that from the beginning of the 30s, USSR was aimed at building an enormous military air fleet. Practically neither funds nor materials were allocated to civil aviation. Passenger aircraft construction was mainly performed by enthusiasts. Thus, Alexander Putilov built a four-seat passenger Steel II aircraft and a six-seat Steel III thereafter. Both aircraft were based upon one and the same technology defining their names. The designer realized fragility of wooden aircraft. The hard-to-find aluminum was in the first place used for the construction of military aircraft. Steel was the only accessible construction material for civil aviation. Putilov welded steel tubes into the frame of his aircraft. On top he put fabric. The new technology took a lot of time to be mastered. The airframe appeared very labor-consuming and expensive as compared to the wooden one. Moreover, the aircraft was not much lasting since the welding points corroded quickly. But there was no choice. Both aircraft were put into production and were operational until the war. The amount of enthusiasts building aircraft in the 30s was enormous. Such was the passion to aviation. Aircraft were built everywhere. Some of them were becoming famous thanks to movies. Thus, LK-1 aircraft designed by Rantel and Lisichkin took part in the popular film The Brave 7. The aircraft was also known as the Near 2. The most successful in creating passenger aircraft was Andrei Tupolev. By that time, he was already a renowned designer. Therefore, he had an opportunity to make all-metal aircraft, and he used not only steel, but also solid, light aluminum alloys. Besides, Tupolev found a nice technical method, which he then used repeatedly. In order to lower the passenger aircraft cost and reduce technical risks, he developed them as versions of already existing military samples. Thus, ANT-9 passenger aircraft based upon P-6 reconnaissance aircraft found its wide use. Works started in December 1927 and within just half a year Moscovites could see the first prototype machine during the May demonstration at the Red Square. In summer, the aircraft passed the state tests and performed an international flight visiting many European cities. At first, ANT-9 was equipped with foreign engines, while later, a version with two more powerful Soviet engines appeared. This way, it was put into production under the definition of PS-9. It had a crew of two men and a comfortable cabin to accommodate nine passengers. Around 70 of these aircraft were produced and they were operating on minor range air routes. One of these aircraft was turned into a spiel truck. Leaders of this country regarded aviation as a powerful instrument of propaganda. A special Maxim Gorky agitation squadron was formed in 1933. Aircraft carried names of newspapers and magazines on sideboards. Specially decorated PS-9 carried the name Crocodile after the popular satiric journal. The squadron flag aircraft ANT-14 carried the name of the Pravda newspaper. 
the aircraft was built on the basis of TB-3 military bomber. Therefrom, the passenger aircraft inherited the wing, the tail, and the landing gear. In August 1931, just a year after the design was started, Mikhail Gromov took the aircraft into the sky. With a five-man crew, the aircraft could take 36 passengers on board. However, in those years, civil aviation did not need such a big aircraft. That's how it appeared in the Propaganda Squadron, where throughout 10 years it made over a thousand flights without a single accident. The next squadron flag aircraft was AT-20. Here is its story. After TB-3, Andrei Tupolev made TB-4, a twice heavier bomber. However, by that time the militaries were not satisfied with its characteristics and lost interest in the aircraft. So the bomber was used as a basis for designing the passenger AT-20. The giant's construction cost a lot. And so then, a famous journalist, Mikhail Kaltsov, proposed to collect funds from people. In a short time, six million rubles were collected. Comrade Nikrasov, here is our first check for half a million rubles. The first, but not the last one, for the construction of Maxim Gorky aircraft. The aircraft was dedicated to the 40th anniversary of Maxim Gorky's literary activity and it was named Maxim Gorky. In June 1934, test pilot Mikhail Gromov took this aircraft to its first flight, while the second one was over the Red Square at the meeting of the Chelyuskin expedition. In August of the same year, the aircraft was transferred to the propaganda squadron named after Maxim Gorky. It carried different equipment and means of propaganda, a loudspeaker system, the voice from the sky, several radio stations, cinema and printing equipment, power station, pneumatic mail, and a telephone station for 16 numbers. If needed, it could be transformed into a 72-seat passenger aircraft. At that time, it was the world's largest aircraft. The wingspan of this eight-engine giant was 63 meters, and its weight was 42 tons. Unfortunately, it flew for less than a year. On May 18, 1935, it fell down near the Sokol village in Moscow after the escort fire hit its wing. PS-124 passenger aircraft became successor of ANT-20. It was built at the Kazan Aircraft Producing Factory. Works were headed by Boris Sauke. After the tests, the aircraft was passed over to Aeroflot. But like the previous giants, it had no use. The country did not have sufficient passenger flow to pack 64-seat aircraft. The only PS-124 built was operating at the Moscow Mineral Waters route. In the beginning of the war, it was used to carry cargoes in the rear. It crashed at landing in December 1942. Other Tupolev's aircraft served in air flot as well. Being second after the Air Force, civil aviation received written off bombers. After repair and disarming, they were transferred to civil aviation where they were used for transporting cargo. Such practice was widely used. TB-1 bombers served under the index G-1, while TB-3 became G-2 civil aircraft. Minor military aircraft also obtained civil professions. R-5 reconnaissance plane was used in the interests of various civil institutions. On the basis of this aircraft, engineer Aram Rafael Jans designed a four-seat passenger plane, which was put into serial production. Airplanes in air flot virtually worked until the end of their resource and were written off after many years of service. Civil pilots gained much more flight hours than the military ones. Millionaire pilots started to appear. The first to fly one million kilometers was Nikolai Shibanov. 
по юбилей в связи с налетом миллиона километров на линиях гражданского воздушного флота отмечен высшей правительственной наградой – орденом Ленина. My jubilee in connection with one million flown kilometers is marked by the Order of Lenin, the highest state award. I'm proud of it. One million kilometers is approximately 25 times around the world by equator, 10 months stay in the air. It is like a round trip to the moon and back to the moon. I'm not going to stay there and try to be back as soon as possible. While passenger aircraft speed hardly reached 200 km per hour, in military aviation high-speed aircraft started to appear. Engines became more powerful, aerodynamics more improved. Of course, Airflot wanted to have new machines as well. The first high-speed passenger aircraft in the USSR was designed by Joseph Neman in 1932. Interesting enough, but it was this seven-seat aircraft that first stepped over the 300 km per hour limit. Besides, it was the first in the USSR aircraft with retractable landing gear. In the 30s, under the definition high one it was successfully used on different air routes. In May 1934, a tender was announced for a passenger aircraft which speed would exceed 400 km per hour. Out of dozens of projects, Steel 7, designed by Roberto Bartini, was outstanding. This 12-seat aircraft was built by autumn 1936 and showed excellent flight characteristics. In spring next year, Steel 7 was even planned to go for a round-the-world trip. But this was limited to a probe flight, Moscow, Sverdlovsk, Sebastopol, Moscow. On this route, the aircraft reached a record speed of 405 km per hour. But the aircraft did not go into production. Bartini was named enemy of the nation and further works were terminated. Later, on its basis, ER-2 long-range bomber was made by designer Yermolaev. Another aircraft made in the framework of the tender was PS-89. It was designed and built by engineer Laville, invited to the Soviet Union from France. The aircraft had unusual for the Soviet design school elegant shape. Tests showed good flight characteristics, but for the purposes of safety, designers limited its speed to 300 km per hour. This aircraft had limited production rate and was used at some routes in the far north, as well as the moscow simferopol air route. Andrei Tupolev based its high-speed passenger aircraft on a high-speed bomber. Designer fulfilled the set requirements. ANT-35 showed good speed characteristics. But there was one sufficient default in the airframe. The cabin ceiling was too low. During production, it was extended. The aircraft joined Airflot under the definition PS-35, although there were 11 of them built. By that time, the Soviet Union already bought a license to produce American DC-3 passenger aircraft. That's how the PS-84 story started in the USSR. This aircraft became a landmark not only for the Soviet civil fleet, but for the entire national aviation. The process of the license acquisition of the aircraft production and its historically long flight life deserves a separate story. In the Soviet Union, the blueprints of the American aircraft were elaborated under the guidance of Vladimir Misishev. This allowed to start production of PS-84 in 1938. In September 1942, it was named Li-2. At first, Li-2 could carry 14 passengers at a distance of 1,100 kilometers. Later, the number of seats was expanded to 21. Li-2 
B-2 became the main aircraft of the Soviet civil fleet. It proved to be a good passenger and cargo aircraft. Wide use of Li-2 was based on its reliability, cost efficiency, and easy piloting. Pilots used to say, just don't interfere with its flying. By 1940, there were 150 airports in the USSR and a lot of local airdromes. Construction of the Moscow Central Vnukovo Airport was coming to an end. The air route's distance by that time reached 150,000 kilometers. Approaching the front line. Are you scared a bit? Take it easy. Easy? Hold on. With the start of the war, the USSR civil aviation was put under direct control of the Commissariat of National Defense. Six special task air groups were formed. Aircraft were used to redeploy troops, to keep contact with partisans, to withdraw the wounded, to deliver ammunition and materials to the front line and special groups to the enemy's rear. The whole mass of Li-2 was refurbished into bombers. All new equipment was taken for the needs of the front and the old worn-out machines were left in the rear. Passenger deliveries inside the country were practically frozen. Certain qualitative changes in the civil aviation started in 1943 after the turning point in the war. The Red Army started its advance to the west, the more the faster. This required fast redeployment of the troops, ammunition and fuel. Retreating fascists were destroying railroads, so one of the only means of the troops' fly was aviation. Secondly, no doubt sooner or later, the Soviet forces were to enter Germany, and of course a huge number of cargo aircraft would be needed to carry out fancy trophies. Therefore, Li-2 production skyrocketed in 1944, making it finally the main aircraft of the national civil aviation. Neither Xie-2 appearing in 1943 nor the light cargo Yak-6 could in any way compete with Li-2. The only aircraft considered to be better than Li-2 was C-47. These American airplanes arriving in the USSR on land lease were used in the end of the war and right after it. Both C-47 and Li-2 were much alike since they were born from Douglas DC-3. But unlike Li-2, C-47 had pure American engines, higher execution quality, and had a much impressive, for that time, navigating equipment. Regular passenger transportations frozen during the war started to gain momentum immediately thereafter. The victorious 1945 was marked by a doubled increase in the civil transportations as compared to 1940. Further on, flight intensity continued to grow. Some of the pilots reached record flight hours numbers. The oldest Soviet pilot Nikolai Novikov returned to Moscow from a regular flight. Friends greeted him upon his jubilee. Nikolai Novikov covered three million kilometers. No other pilot in the world could claim such a record. Three times millionaire Novikov dedicated his record to the 30th anniversary of the Great October. Apart from the mass Li-2, which number reached almost 5,000, new aircraft started to appear in the Soviet Union. Designers were responding to the growing demand. Yakovlev Design Bureau offered Yak-16, a minor passenger aircraft that could take up to 10 passengers on board. However, it did not comply with the range of civil transportation of that time and the aircraft was not put into production. 
A new aircraft of Soviet design, Il-12, joined air flight lines in 1947. It was started in Illusion Design Bureau in 1943. The first sample went on tests with diesel engines promising long range. But in practice, such engines proved to be unreliable and Il-12 was approaching production stage with petrol engines. A lot was devoted toward reliability of this aircraft. It was examined in various, sometimes critical, modes. Tests were conducted at high attack angle, at spin, in one default engine flight, and under heavy icing conditions. Once, when researching an electric field near a thunderous cloud, Il-12 was sucked into it by a turbulent flow. Test pilot Vasily Shutov dropped the wheel which was struggling out of his hands. The radio operator shouted, take the wheel or we'll be thrown out to somewhere. I'll take it when we'll be thrown out. And indeed, Il-12 got out of the turbulence all by itself with a little left tilt and lowered nose. The aircraft could carry up to 32 passengers or 2.5 tons of cargo. The range was 1,100 kilometers and the cruise speed of 300 kilometers per hour. On June 1, 1947, Il-12 made its first passenger flight. A total of around 700 of these aircraft were built. They served in civil aviation until the end of the 60s, the cost of transportation on Il-12 was twice lower than on Li-2. Il-12 successfully passed such a hard examination as flights in high latitudes. This aircraft was upgraded accordingly to work in the Arctic and later in the Antarctic. They made a deserved contribution to the development of those inaccessible territory. Il-14 became further development of Il-12. In its creation, even more attention was devoted to the issues of safety. It could fly on one engine without losing altitude and even continue to take off with one engine. Il-14 had better stability and controllability than Il-12, higher speed and longer range. This aircraft started passenger transportations in 1954. It had around a dozen of different modifications, including a cargo one, and was produced not only in the USSR, but in the GDR and Czechoslovakia. Il-14M version with a longer fuselage was produced abroad, which allowed to increase passenger load to 40 people. Airflot operated this aircraft with the 32-seat cabin. Il-14 was widely used at routes of long range for that time, Moscow-Prague and Moscow-Sochi. The aircraft stayed in the civil aviation service for many years even after the first jet passenger airliners appeared. AN-2 made its first takeoff in 1947. For those years, it looked as pure anachronism. A single engine, wire braced biplane with a relatively bulky fuselage, it seemed to come from the faraway pre war time. Basically, that's how it was. Oleg Antonov started designing this multi purpose civil aircraft in 1940. The war interrupted his work, which was restarted thereafter. The first prototype agricultural sample took off in 1948 and soon it became clear that it was indeed a multi-purpose aircraft. The biplane airframe with powerful high lift allowed its operation from unprepared fields. The first machines were commissioned in summer 1948. Until 1991, they transported over 370 million people, at least twice the entire population of the USSR. Anushkis performed practically all air-related agricultural works. AN-2 was exported to 28 countries. It was produced in Poland and China. The total produced number is impressive, almost 17,000 aircraft in 20 different modifications. It still flies, and there is no substitution in its class. 
That's what you call an outdated design. Unprecedented activity in the sphere of commercial transportation was observed in the West after the war. On the one hand, this resulted from the outburst of the businesses returning to peaceful life. On the other hand, air tickets prices were accessible. This had its own explanation. Passenger aircraft were cheap, since they represented an enormous amount of refurbished military transport aircraft left after the war. Former bombers were upgraded for the use at civil air routes. Air deliveries in the USSR went up as well, but their extent could hardly be compared with the foreign ones. European part of this country laid in ruins. Soviet people suffered from hunger and hardships. Most of the population could not afford itself using airplanes. However, designers hoped that time for mass air transportation would come and started making large passenger aircraft. In August 1946, Illusion Design Bureau started testing IL-18 for 66 passengers. This definition was later used once again for the aircraft with turboprop engines, while this IL-18 was equipped with piston engines. Fuselage was pressurized for flying at high altitude, making the air drag lower, the speed higher, and the fuel consumption lesser. All this provided IL-18 a longer range than of its predecessor. The aircraft matched the time requirements put before a large passenger airliner. At that time, Tupolev Design Bureau started to design a similar aircraft. They were actively copying the American B-29 bomber and conjointly designed a passenger aircraft. The important state order on the bomber creation could not be turned down, so in the design of the passenger aircraft, Tupolev used his proven method of minimizing means and efforts. Only the fuselage was new in the aircraft defined as Tu-70. The wing, the tail, and the engines were taken from the ready-for-copying B-29. This allowed to reduce developments to half a year, and the first Tu Yosemite flight happened already in November 1946. First, a luxury version for 48 passengers was designed. Later, the fuselage was expanded to accommodate 72 seats. The passenger cabin was pressurized, heated, and there was a ventilation system, a kitchen, and a refrigerator. Serial production of the airliner was a simple task. Most of its units were similar to those mounted on Tu-4 bomber, which was already in production. However, the time for serious airliners in the Soviet Union was yet to come. Il-18 and Tu-70 were ahead of their time. Air Flot was still quite satisfied with Il-12 and Li-2. Practically all airliners of the first post-war generation were equipped with piston engines. At that time, aircraft with jet engines already started to appear. They were first of all military aircraft, since technical imperfection of the first jet engines did not allow to use them for commercial purposes. Nevertheless, it was already clear that future was with the jet thrust. The British were the first to follow this route. The Haviland Company designed the Comet passenger aircraft. It was the first to enter passenger air routes. But rush led to a series of tragedies. After several accidents, the British had to close the aircraft operations for a number of years. Development of passenger jet aircraft in the United States was conducted by Boeing and Douglas. The first was completing its Boeing 707. Douglas was a bit inferior with its DC-8, but it was close to its first flight as well. Nobody even thought that the Russians will outrun them all. In March 1956, during Khrushchev's visit to England, 
three airplanes landed in the London airport. They were TU-104 turning superstars at once. It was fantastic. The aircraft had only two engines while the entire world equipped their airliners with four from the point of view of reliability and safety. Making a sensation in the West, TU-104 made a revolution in its own country. Its appearance was directly linked to the changes in the internal political life of the USSR. The new leader, Nikita Khrushchev, was very interested in such an aircraft. Based on technical achievements, he gladly demonstrated to the West the advantages of socialism. One year before the described events, on June 17, 1955, the crew of Yuri Alashev first took the aircraft into the sky. The first takeoff is always unusual in the life of any aircraft, but this was a special event. It was the start of the jet era in the civil aviation. As usual, Tupolev made an airliner out of a bomber. Completely new was only the fuselage. The wing, the tail and the power plant were all taken from TU-16. The airframe continuity allowed to significantly reduce the work schedule. Development of the first serial samples went in such a hurry that they were made in Kharkov virtually in the open air workshops were not yet restored after the war. The plant started production of the new aircraft already in November 1955. Virtually no other passenger aircraft led to such huge changes in the entire structure of airflot as TU-104. By that time, the civil aviation kingdom was overwhelmed by piston engine aircraft. The jet first link rushing into that kingdom demanded extension of the takeoff and landing strips, reformation of the entire airport infrastructure, maintenance bases, and air control management system. The jet equipment required transition to a principally new fuel, kerosene. Pilots for TU-104 were prepared in a special way. Factories, military, and then civil test pilots were the first ones to master the aircraft. Then they shared their experience with the airline pilots. Airflot formed the first group of pilots to fly TU-104. Only the best were selected with the competition being no less intense than to become a cosmonaut. Until TU-104 was getting ready, the pilots were training by performing long-range flights from Moscow to Sverdlovsk and Novosibirsk on Il-28 jet bombers. For the first time in the Soviet practice, such flight allowed to form statistic data on the speed, wind direction, air turbulence, temperature drops at different altitudes. Analysis and systematization of such information allowed to work out methodological instructions for the operation of TU-104, a new aircraft in civil aviation. Such flights helped to work out new navigation systems. TU-104 was equipped with a radar which allowed to determine the aircraft's exact location, prompted the crew of any thunderstorms, mountains, or other aircraft ahead. September 15, 1956, was a historic date. TE-104 performed its first passenger flight from Moscow to Irkutsk. A 
train travels to Irkutsk almost six days. The standard flight lasted no less than 20 hours. Passengers of this aircraft arrived in Irkutsk within seven hours and ten minutes after the takeoff from Moscow. Soon, the first jet passenger aircraft started to fly to other cities. Attention, all boards. The arrow is approaching. This radio announcement meant that another TU-104 was preparing to land and all piston engine machines must hurry to clear up the zone for the jet airliner. Serious problems were discovered at the beginning of operations, and it could not be otherwise. TU-104 was not just new, it was a revolutionary new aircraft. Soon problems were resolved, and the leader of the jet era TU-104 took its deserved place in the air fleet of Airflot. After TU-104, we have been making even a bigger aircraft, which would carry 170 people. And our team is very proud that we can dedicate this aircraft to the 40th anniversary of the Great October. Other jet airliners followed up, but TU-104 was the first. <laughs> 